Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this video, I'm going to be going through the official adventures for Shadow Dark that were released by Kelsey over at the Arcane Library. These adventures, there are six of them. I'm not going to go through uh, all of them in detail. I'm going to go through a couple of them and then I'm going to give you the maps and things of the others, but uh, I don't want to go through all of these. They're only two pages each, except this first one, which is four pages. These are very short adventures. But I think they are really excellent. First of all, they're just great adventures, but they're also excellent, uh, I would say, introductions to what Shadow Dark is. Now, these are for higher level adventures. These are level three, four, and six. Uh, four levels, three, four, and six. So they're not for brand new players, but they are really good for new DMs or GMs looking at how to design for Shadow Dark. There's a lot of great, I would say, uh, design. I wouldn't say divine ad design advice. There's no advice in these books, but there's just it's uh, great examples to draw from. Uh, there's a lot of material here for your induction, right? <laughs> for your inductive reasoning to to draw from and to create your own adventures out of. I think right now there is a lot of kind of shovelware, right? For Shadow Dark, it's the new thing. It's easy to design for, and so a lot of people are throwing kind of anything that they have out there for it. And let's be honest, a lot of it is really low quality. I don't think that's anything against the system itself. In fact, I think that's it speaks to the simplicity of the system and how, how easy it is to pick up and run and to design for. But it does mean that it's kind of the system of choice for people who are, you know, just trying to make a quick buck, I think. At least it's one of those systems out there where people are throwing things out there for it. And a lot of times, you know, I, I've had this just recently. Uh, several several examples <laughs> recently where I've purchased Shadow Dark adventures or products, and sometimes they're not that cheap, upwards of fifteen dollars, and I'm just kind of shocked at how amateurish and really low quality it is. And maybe that's on me for buying it, but in at least one case, it was from a seller that I thought I, I expected more from. I, I've I've I know that this particular person is a member of the community and has made a lot of products that people seem to like and so I picked it up with you know kind of high expectations and I was very disappointed and I think a lot of it has to do with how easy it is to design for Shadow Dark but there's also this temptation of well I could do that I could make it I could make something that was like that if I took 20 minutes to do it really are you going to charge me for something that I could do in 20 minutes of work and that's sort of what I'm, I'm, I'm worried about so these adventures are not like that these are all really good and they have good design inspiration for those who are interested in designing for Shadow Dark, but don't want to join the growing ranks of people who are just kind of throwing really low quality stuff at the at the hobby. <laughs> we don't need more of that. Um, I'm talking about, you know, of course, paid quality stuff. If, you, if you're doing pay what you want or free, then, you know, throw whatever you want out there. That's awesome. I, you know, I have, we can't complain about those things. The value of a free product is infinite, right? well, mathematically speaking. But when you're going to charge money for a product, it has to be pretty good. And I think these are good examples of, of, of cheap, but also low... Um, well, uh, high quality, low cost, short adventures that if you're interested in putting something out, this is sort of the, the bar you'd want to you'd want to set. This is or this is the bar you'd want to reach in order to charge. I would say for Shadow Dark adventures. Now these all come in a bundle except this first one, the Concealed Abbey of the Dragonfly Horde. This is a great adventure. It's four pages, two of which is the adventure itself, and then two are supplemental. So basically, you have stat blocks and magic items, and then uh, one reference to this thing. So basically, this is a, a dungeon where there is this old dragonfly god, demigod thing that's encased in amber, and there used to be a cult to it, and now croak folk, frog folk, have come in and have started to eat all of the cultists, and uh, it makes sense, right? Dragonflies and frogs. It's kind of an interesting theme. So one of the things that I like about this adventure is, and, and something that people could take inspiration from, is a theme that makes sense in its relation to the world <laughs> that we actually know. Dragonflies and frogs. You get a brief description. A strange buzzing rises in the ears of travelers near the mist-shrouded swamp, and feverish dreams of gold and amber haunt their sleep. So there's a hook right there. Then you have a description of why that is. The hungry croak folk have invaded the hidden abbey of the dragonfly cultists. The patron being who resides within now calls for help tempting mortals with visions of gleaming riches. Which is great. You have a d4 table for random encounters because this is a very short dungeon. You're probably not going to roll that many random encounters so you don't need a huge table. And then you get the buzzing, which is a buzzing that grows louder. So it's a feature throughout the whole dungeon. So again, um, just look at this design really quickly. You have a map with uh, everything labeled pretty clearly. You have random encounter table, you have a hook, and what's actually going on, 
and a feature of the whole dungeon all on one page. Incredible design. Really, really excellent design. You could run this whole dungeon this with just this. Because even though the rooms are described later, you have enough here to run it yourself. You could just add in stuff for each of these rooms. You have the sorts of random encounters you're going to run into, so you kind of know what is going on here. So you could do all the rest yourself now. Kelsey gives you more, obviously. So we'll go through that really quickly. So um, let's see the next page. Here we go. All right, so here's just the description of the dungeon itself. The room one is that deadfall, the canyon, and you have a really great design as is usual for any Shadow Dark product with the standard formatting. You have um, bolding, you have italics, you have parentheses, and uh, bullet points and, and sub bullet points to help describe the, the room. So it's really easy to run on the fly. You have a deadfall with different ways of getting down. You drop straight down, you can go down the stairs or you can cl climb the vines. A foyer of offerings, that's that big central room. Um, if we go back to this, that's room two. And in this, you have a wrought iron gate, which blocks the fountain. Uh, and then you have a statue uh, on top of this fountain. And its eyes are multifaceted red gemstones. So how are you going to get past the gate? There's a warning there that says, don't touch the... So pretty clearly, right? <laughs> Something, some, something's going on there. Um, and the... Uh, there's, there's gold coins in the bowl, which the question is, are we, are we not supposed to touch the gold or are we not supposed to touch the uh, eyes, right? Don't touch the, and you don't know. It's also very noisy to break open, so you can choose to do it, risk versus reward. Great design, right? You want risk versus reward. You want uh, quick choices. It's not a long, drawn out choice, but it's a quick choice. And then there's a question, what are we not supposed to touch? Um, well, we could take a risk and touch both, we could touch the one, and if nothing happens, then we know it's the other, or we could leave, right? Do we take the gold, do we take the rubies, do we take neither, or both? So great indication that there's something here, but, um, but you know, beyond that, not much. And that's all you need. You have room three, which is the dragonfly hatchery. This is where there's croak folk just eating dragonflies, um, having a good time. At the bottom, there's a Helm of Humming, which is one of the magic items here. Now, if you go back to the map, you'll see all of the seas on there are Croak Folk. So it tells you right on the map where the creatures are. There are two Croak Folk in room three, so you have them right there. Um, all the way down to uh, room four, which is the Inner Sanctum. It's a shaft that leads up to a ledge in a hallway, and then the body of a frog-like man twisted at the bottom. The frog-like idea here is interesting. That's the that's croak folk sort of thing. You have a, a big room where they're fighting, and then there is an altar with an ancient wagon-sized dragonfly inside it. Super cool. I love that. Um, then you have the Grand Hall itself, which is a bunch of dragonfly cultists glued to the ceiling. And the Catrathis, who's a stubborn, apocalyptic, dying dragonfly cultist. Um, and that dragonfly avatar is going to come out, right? So the fro croak folk are just sitting there, kind of hanging out. They don't know that this avatar of their of their uh, cult, the enemy cult, is about to break free, and you're about you're about to run into it if you run into this room. So you have factions a little bit. There's not a lot, but there's enough. And in the random encounters, you can run into both croak folk and a dragonfly cultist. So you could. You could have that happen, and then you'd have a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, faction play. But this is a very short dungeon, so it's not really going to be. This is definitely a one-shot dungeon. It's, it's five rooms. You're really going to finish it quickly. Um, and then you get the uh, the dragonfly eye diadem, the final thing there. Destroy a ruby to summon a loyal giant dragon life for five rounds. That's awesome. So you have six magic items there in that eye diadem. Then you have monsters and treasure, croak, fro croak folk, dragonfly avatar, dragonfly cultists, giant dragonfly, and the helm of humming. What it does. And then the patron. And he can become a patron for you. Which is really cool, right? So there's something that builds on past this adventure. And that is the whole thing. So this is excellent little dungeon design. You have choices. You have places to go. You have a little bit of faction play. 
There's a cool theme that fits throughout the whole thing. There is a feature that runs through the whole dungeon. There's enough treasure and magic items for that as well. There's going to be some combat regardless of what you do. There's a cool boss fight at the end that's gross and kind of interesting. And then there's a potential thing that goes past the adventure. Now, this sort of adventure design I don't think you can teach, right? I mean, Kelsey is a is a is an expert at this. I mean, <laughs> she knows what she's doing. So this is just really excellent, quick dungeon design. Small dungeons um, need to have something like this, but it has all of those major features that you want out of a dungeon. Good theme, good treasure, good enemies, faction play, interesting location, uh, a really interesting boss fight, and treasure. Great. The Concealed Abbey of the Dragonfly Horde. Uh, really recommend. Highly recommend this one. Now, it's not part of... I don't think it's part of the bundle of the other five adventures, so you have to get this one separately. But the other five adventures, which I'm going to run through briefly, um, are all in a bundle you can get together. Uh, I think it's for $5 or something like that, so it's very cheap. The first of these is the Wavestone Monolith, which is, once again, it's the same design. The, you get the Fear the silence, the water, the dark stone itself. So a little flavor text. You have uh, what's going on. Deep within the sweltering jungle, a monolith of black basalt floats above an undulating lake hidden in a cave. So awesome location. They say inhuman howls emanate from it on moonless nights. And the fat gems and coins of the lost society lie inside for the taking. So hooks. Well, hooks built right in there. An interesting location to go and explore. Some, uh, some you know, monster to go fight in human howls. And money. Then you have random encounters, and then you have this antediluvian shell. Wielder can speak primordial and breathe water. Wielder stops aging, but skull prematurely turns into a nautilus ship over two to ten days. One per week can be with nautiloid mother. So that's something you can uh, find. A magic item you can find here. You have a <clears throat> excuse me. You have a brief uh, just overview of the of the place map, which isn't very big. Again, it's only, it's a little bit bigger, nine rooms as opposed to five from the previous one. But this one has everything that you need on just two pages. It doesn't have an extra list of creatures. Now, the random encounters, you'll notice are, uh, there's bowling. That refers to the actual Shadow Dark book and stat blocks of soldiers, peasant, leeches, and berserkers. And then you get the description of the dungeon itself with roaring waterfall as you enter in. The cave, right, so you have to pass through a waterfall to get here, which is awesome. A cool location with a really creepy mask uh, statue, mask statue right at the entrance. So again, something warning and creepy and cool. We'll treasure there as well. The cave itself and the black cigarette at the center. So again, these are like really fantastic locations. You're gonna, your players are gonna remember this location. It's not another dusty crypt. It's not another boring you know, cave. This is an interesting place. Uh, it's all got fossils and ammonites and trilobites and just, you know, got all this imagery and fossils. So again, re recurring motifs throughout, which keeps the, the theme going. You've got leeches, uh, black puddings, this statue of the nautiloid mother. So there's something kind of going on in the background. And then you've simply got um, the berserkers and, and peasants here, uh, tentacles sprouting from their faces. And then you've got a brain eater, which you probably know what that is, right? That's why this is a higher level adventure. This one is for third level. It's not first level. We're not going to run to a brain eater here. Doesn't mean you have to kill the brain eater, Klaxul, but you might. And then once again, if you look at the map here, you have the things described very briefly. Uh, where berserkers are, where the monsters are, right? So a uh, really, really cool little thing there. And giant leeches there and berserkers here and moving forward. Once again, you have a really cool location. You have cool treasure. You have a cool boss. Uh, you have hooks. You have interesting, well, uh, this one, the monsters are a little less interesting. You got berserkers and soldiers, but they're kind of gone wild by this, this uh, place. And they're starting to mutate into these brain eaters themselves or the tentacled faces and things. That's cool. So another interesting, short, it doesn't overstay its welcome. Adventure. It just gives you two pages, everything you need to run it. Um, stat blocks aside, which is something you can add in from the Shadow Dark book. And the same thing with, you know, magic items. This one has wands of acid, arrows, scrolls of bless, but it has that one specific magic item on the first, the antediluvian shell, which you can find on the brain eater itself. 
Okay, so the Wavestone Monolith, excellent little adventure again. I think the, the, the phrase here, you want to look, well, before I go to that, look at the design here. Two different ways in and out of the dungeon, which is awesome, different ways to approach. And then once you're in, choices about where to go and how to pass through the entirety of the place. Now, you could just go straight for the Brain Eater. You could just walk straight into it. There's no set path through this dungeon where you have to go. Things are a little bit more like you go to this point and there's a dead end, you go to that point and there's a dead end. But you get you start off with that choice of whether to go um, down into one area or down into the other. Um, and uh, I, I think it's just a great, great design little dungeon. Uh, the third is the Hidden Leprechaun Hollow. Face a tricksome leprechaun and claim his treasure before time runs out. So this one's obviously a little bit more silly, but it's not something you're going to forget either. A spring rain has traced the sky with a brilliant rainbow. Everyone knows the legend of Leprechaun's hidden abode lies at the end of it. And if you're fast and bold enough, you can steal the mischievous phase cache of gold. There's a rainbow door. The rainbow touches a rocky cave, illuminating a magical door. For two hours of real time, the PCs can enter freely and exit through the door. When the rainbow fades, PCs stuck inside must find another way out. So that's it, right? You have two hours. This is a timed adventure. Once again, you get that very short random encounter table. And if you look at this dungeon, you can see it's got tricks and traps, dead ends, it's much more of a, you know, a, a uh, regular sort of D&D uh, &D adventure in terms of its design. But it has uh, another alternate way in and out, so if you do get stuck, you can you do have an option of how to get out here. Uh, with plenty of secret doors. Uh, you get, once again, those brief descriptions of your location. Entry hall with a plush crimson carpet, mahogany beams, it's, it's a hall. And as you go through the rooms, you realize this isn't so much a cave. This is a a, uh, a home. You've got beds and you've got furnishings and you've got stoves and distilleries and a cobbler's shop, right? This is a leprechaun's home. This is There's a hall of mirrors. There's a nice lounge here with a fire elemental. I think this is great. So this is not something you're necessarily going to have to fight your way through entirely. There's a troll here who complains that no one's brought her her tea. After four rounds of grousing, D, four rounds of grousing, she fumbles on her spectacles and attacks anyone who isn't Lemony McGillis, the leprechaun. She stops if given warm tea. Great, right? So there's a way to not just immediately fight the, uh, the, the troll. There's a fire elemental. Um... He'll let people pass if given something fun to burn. So you have these combat, potentially combat encounters, but encounters you don't have to. Um, if you take these shoes in the wrong right room or in the wrong room in the cobbling shop, then you're attacked by hobnail boots. So again, a great adventure with silly things going on. This would be a fun one shot for, for St. Patrick's Day or for just any kind of fun short adventure that you want to run. Now this one is a little higher level. Oh, this is also third level. Yeah, this is also third level. So um, you're dealing with fairies and wasps and badgers and trolls and boots that attack you in halls of mirrors and a distillery. It's obviously very silly, but it works really, really well for a quick one shot. Again, strong theme. Strong theme, imaginative ideas, easy, uh, straightforward dungeon design with enough loops and choices and ways of dealing with these encounters that aren't strictly combat that are given to you in the description itself. So NPCs that actually want things. That's awesome. So again, I really recommend this one. Now, the other three, I'm just going to show you guys the first pages of. I'm not going to go through uh, the, the rooms in too much detail. You got the Twisting Cave of the Pale Ones. This is a fourth level adventure for Shadow Dark. Now, this one is also, I think, really cool, but it's a little bit creepier. It's got that creepy thing to it, albino sting bats. Um, this one is about pirates, and you've got the mother, which of course is a is a really dangerous uh, sting bat. Uh, flashing white demons whirl in nighted caves, flitting over coffers of pirate gold left to rot in the darkness. Long ago, the dread pirate Red Maria hid one of her treasure hoards inside a booby-trapped cave. Since then, a drove of albino sting bats have taken roost inside it. Who will brave the halls of pale death to claim the forgotten treasure? Pirate treasure hidden in a cave with giant bats that uh, basically that, that want to drain your blood. This is, or not bats exactly, but they're, they're um, uh, sturges from D&D &D 5e, right? Sturges. Dire sting bats. Really cool stuff. 
a pirate cave full of pirate treasure with black puddings and a, a pirate gang trying to find the treasure. <laughs> it's awesome. Really great. And if you look at the design of the dungeon, plenty of choices of where to go, plenty of different directions. Uh, there are some dead ends, but that's okay. Expect it in a cave. And there's interesting things in each of these uh, dead ends. There's interesting things and reasons to go there. It's not just like, okay, dead end back the way you came. But there is still enough of that looping uh, direction that, that uh, you know, helps you, directs you where to go. Um, so I like that. I think the, the design of the actual dungeon is good here too. Plenty of traps that you have to be careful for, and lots of good treasure. Lots of good treasure in this one. The Twisting Cave of the Pale Ones for the fourth level shit characters. Uh, then you have the Eroding Isle of the Executioner. Now remember, each of these have two pages. I'm just not going to the next page. The Eroding Isle of the Executioner. This is another fourth level one. Tread carefully in the gilded halls where slow death comes for the condemned. A distant island, island palace sinks into the sea, its sinister purpose hidden among marble, pillars of gold and marble. Even the Hussahagan avoid this place, for it is of a jeweled prison where only poison grows. Who found their opulent deaths here, and what haunted treasures did they leave? So there's the Gorgoth fruit, that's one of the things here. Called the Executioner in Black Markets, a tantalizing red globe of sweet juice and pulp eating causes one permanent hit point damage and a d4 rounds of blind euphoria, maddeningly addictive. DC 15 wisdom to resist eating again. So you can just kill yourself with this Gorgoth fruit as soon as you find it. There are sirens, merfolk, wraiths, and Sahagan, which is really, really cool. And you are um, trying to you know, get through, find this, probably try to find the treasure, maybe even get the fruit. Maybe you need it for something in another game. But you could throw these, this and the previous one, the Twisting Cape of the Pale Ones, into any pirate campaign. I'd probably run this with a... Uh, with the other, um, oh, what was that OSC one? The Black Cove, uh, the Curse of the Black Cove. But I'll, I'll probably run that in that campaign. Just throw these in as a quick little rumor that they can hear about. There's there's this one island where people used to be sent to die. There's there's these fruit there that we want or that someone wants. Don't eat it, right? I mean, you can do a great hook for this adventure. And then uh, finally, we have the Sanctum of the Elephant God. This is a sixth level adventure. So this is much higher for Shadow Dark. Uh, this sounds straight out of Conan the Barbarian, right? The, the, the Elephant God. Face the perils of an unholy cult and reap an incredible reward if you survive. The cultists of the Elephant God lurk in their dark domain, murmuring prayers over a glut of riches. Rumors say the Overlord has paid them a fortune in exchange for their wicked sorcery, and now the jewel of Alcala glitters in their coffers, a prize too tempting to ignore. I mean, it's straight out of Conan. The Jewel of Alcala is a brilliant egg-shaped sapphire of indigo blue, worth a thousand gold pieces. The jewel is a symbol of the crown and grants the wielder the overlord's authority. The royal assassins would hunt down anyone using it illicitly. Oh, let's look at that hook right there. The Jewel of Alcala is here. We have to go find it. That's an incredible thing. So there's the overlord's assassins, you've got scorpions, you've got clay golems, and you've got cultists. This is an awesome adventure because of the what treasure you're trying to get, right? It's a, a particular awesome treasure. This is not some generic thing. This is the jewel of Alcala. This is the authority, the overlord's authority. If you get this, now your players are going to be running around with this very valuable thing. I might throw this into any of um, any any real campaign, but especially like a sword and sorcery campaign. I, I can see throwing this into the the Red Sands of Death, or is it the Red Sands of Death? Whatever it's called, the uh, the second of the Curse Scroll zines, They're running in that desert. So I could see throwing the Sanctum of the Elephant God into that world, and it would work. It seems like it would work really, really well. You'd make the assassins those uh, sort of, uh, whatever they were, kind of ninja, <laughs> you know, the ninja guys from that one curse scene. I forget what they're called. They're really cool, though. So here you go. Awesome uh, adventure. The, the, the clay golems are elephantine. Uh, the cultists have peasants that you could, that you could rescue. There's an assassin, obviously, who's trying to keep this jewel safe. There's scorpions in here. I love this. I think this is a really cool adventure. And again, I'm not going to go into detail uh, on, in the, on the next page, but the, the room descriptions are great, and, and the, uh, the, the, just the, the crawling process here would be really fun in all of these, but especially, I think, in this one in particular, with plenty of choices about where to go and directions and you know, places to explore and reasons to go the different directions that you go. So all of these are really excellent, and I wish that, that a lot of people designing for Shadow Dark would take these to heart, these official adventures, because Shadow Dark has a certain set of things that it does really well, right? There's a certain dungeon crawling proce process that it does really well. The gold for experience process that, that you need uh, works really well as long as you kind of have the proper proportions of gold and, and sort of things like that. 
uh, the way that combat works, the way that random encounters work, and the way that faction play works. Obviously, that applies to any dungeon, but Shadow Dark um, seems to me to be attracting people who are designing for Shadow Dark the way that people design for 5e or something like that. And it's, it just doesn't work the same way. So I think, I wish, yeah, people would study these adventures and just to get a sense of how to approach the process of dungeon design, especially small dungeons. If you're doing a big mega dungeon or a massive dungeon, right, it's going to be a different process of design. But for something small like this, one to ten room dungeons, or five to ten room dungeons, I should say, then these are excellent adventures, and uh, I highly recommend you guys pick them all up. I'll put links below to where you can get them. All right, well, I hope this has been interesting, and I hope it wasn't too ranty. I know that <laughs> right now I'm thinking I've just been burned a couple of times very recently by bad Shadow Dark products, and so I'm like, ah, you know, it's on my mind. Anyway, I hope you guys found this interesting, and I'll see you in another video.